you're here for the very first time today, uh, <laughs> let me say, please stand by, all right? Please stand by. So we're a, a Bible church. In fact, uh, we just spent about 18 months in the Gospel of Matthew, and at some point, probably in June, we're going to go into the Acts of the Apostles. But periodically, we take on some cultural topics, and Memorial Day Sunday is uh, kind of our wild card, um, yeah, our wild card Sunday, if you will, all right? And so uh, welcome, and uh, glad you're here. I hope you'll come back. But uh, let, me, um, let me tell you why we're doing this, first of all. So um, back in 1859, a book entitled The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin was published, and it clandestinely launched a brand new ideology known as evolution. Now, when it first came out, um, the Christian community pretty much scoffed, and rightfully so, I might add, you know, scoffed at it, didn't take it serious. But meanwhile, it was gaining ground. It snowballed into Western civilization, into the, especially the academic circles, and no one's laughing today about evolution. In fact, uh, from grade to postgraduate school, the theory, I might add, the theory, false theory of evolution is taught as fact, right? I mean, every program you're going to watch on National Geographic Channel or History Channel, uh, they just naturally presume that evolution is true. And uh, the exact same thing is happening here on our watch right now in 2019. The exact same thing is happening right underneath our noses. Uh, this worldview is gaining ground daily from a broad spectrum. And so a part of the purpose today is to be like the men of Issachar. Men of Issachar, what's that got to do with anything? Well, in First Chronicles chapter 12, we're told that David finally becomes king after living the life of a fugitive. They begin to come to him from the various different tribes. And we're told, hey, some guys you know, from the tribe of Dan, they're really good with shield and spear. Some guys are really good with all weapons of war. Hey, some guys, they can do the slingshot left-handed and right-handed. And it says, and then there were the men of Issachar. And it says they, First uh, Chronicles 12, 32, is they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. And so really, that's kind of our goal today is to understand our times, know what we as the church should do. And so um, let me just encourage you to hang with us today. And as Jackie Gleason once said, and away we go. So let's jump into it. So um, those of you who are watching by video as well, thank you for being with us. So five things you should know about UFOs. Number one, we've kind of already alluded to is the fact that number one, UFOs have gone mainstream. They've gone mainstream, right? So a recent survey by the USA Today uh, revealed that 61% of Americans believe that there are other life forms in the galaxy, 61%. So therefore, in sociological circles, we refer to this as it's crossed the tipping point. The tipping point, what's that? Well, it's a term that's used for those who study demographics and sociological trends. It's that moment when there's, listen to this, enough critical mass to produce widespread sociological changes that affect everyday life and societal beliefs. That's what a tipping point is. And so we have crossed that tipping point under our watch. It's happened. And um, a vast array of people, I mean, this is no longer relegated to tabloids and comic books and the sci-fi channel. Uh, Kenneth, Dr. Kenneth Nelson, who chairs the Sciences Subcommittee for Solar System Exploration, said this, the search for life is no longer a fringe type of thing. Dr. Paul Horowitz, who oversees, uh, it's called BETA, which stands for the Billion Channel Extraterrestrial Assay, says this, quote, intelligent life in the universe, question mark, guaranteed. Intelligent life in our galaxy, so overwhelmingly likely that'd give you almost any odds you'd like. Now, just over 100 years ago, uh, confessing to a belief in the existence of aliens could land you in an insane asylum. Today, it may further your chances for obtaining a research grant at an Ivy League school. All right? um, there's a TV show, some of you perhaps have seen it, that's called Ancient Aliens. It's on um, History Channel. And um, it has received wide criticism, I mean, from uh, scientists and from anthropologists and from archaeologists. They're saying, look, you're using pseudoscience, you're using pseudo-archaeology. Uh, I mean, this isn't real. But that hasn't stopped the show from being successful. In fact, it's about to enter its 10th season. And aside from Pawn Stars, it's the number two most watched show on the History Channel. And it's presented in a documentary type format. And so, uh, number one, 61% of the people believe in the existence of alien life now. So odds are you've got kids, grandkids, co-workers, uh, neighbors who probably lean towards, yeah, there's probably 
extraterrestrial life out there. So that's number one you need to know. If you don't believe in aliens, you're the minority now. All right? Now, I have a special meeting after, no, I'm just kidding, uh, but you're the minority now, all right? Just so you know, most people in the United States believe in it. So that's number one. Number two, people really are seeing something. People really are seeing something, just as you just saw on the video, all right? People, people really are seeing, notice emphasis on the word something, all right? People are seeing something. Jimmy Carter famously said this, I don't laugh at people anymore when they say they've seen a UFO because I've seen one myself. You can kind of hear him say that, can't you? I don't, uh, I don't really laugh. I don't laugh anymore when people say they've seen a UFO because uh, I've seen one myself. Um, now, his uh, predecessor, Gerald Ford, said, I think there may be substance to these UFO reports. So presidents, presidents, astronauts, military personnel, airline personnel all say, hey, we're, we're seeing something out there. Now, one of the most famous, of course, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, happened right here in your Valley of the Sun, right? It was on March 13th, 1997. It was known as the Phoenix Lights incident. I mean, it's gone down in UFO lore. And some of you may have seen that. In fact, uh, unlike other UFO reports that are seen by, you know, swampers uh, in the bayous or what, you know, just, yeah, this one was seen by a lot of people, right? Unlike your typical grainy, blurry photograph, that, I don't know, maybe that's CGI, what, what is that? Uh, yeah, this one was witnessed by thousands of people. There were thousands of eyewitness accounts on this one. And there were some really good photographs taken of it as well, including videotape as well. Now, the jury is still out as to, hey, what was that? We still don't know what it was, but here's my point. People really are seeing something, all right? People are having experiences. They are seeing something. Now, I want to remind us, though, that the U in UFO stands for unidentified, right? It stands for unidentified. Now, a lot of times with some research, they can go from a UFO to an IFO. Uh, from 1947 to 1969, the United States Air Force officially studied the UFO phenomenon under what was known as Project Blue Book. Some of you may have heard of that. Now, listen to these stats. They studied 12,618 sightings. Of the 12,618 sightings, they were able to give an account for 11,917. Now, I know what some of you are saying, and those of you watching on video, oh yeah, well that's the government, you can't trust the government. I'm with you, I get it. But nonetheless, here's the point, the majority could be explained. Some of them were just flat out hoaxes, some of them were military experiments, some of them were NASA experiments, and some of them could be explained by aeronautical or you know, astronomical phenomenon. But the vast majority can be explained. Now, up here you have the SR-71 Blackbird. It didn't go into service until 1964. I mean, could you imagine seeing that in the late 50s when it was being developed? Every plane is al always developed before they go public with it. So anyways, the point being is that a lot of UFO accounts can be explained. Ravi Zacharias said this though, here's the problem. Ravi Zacharias said, we live in a society that thinks with its eyes. We live in a society that thinks with its eyes is what Ravi Zacharias says. And of course we have some close encounter wannabes, right? Uh, some people, um, yeah, some people, no matter what they see, oh, it's alien. Or anything that's unexplainable, I mean, they just go straight to alien. Yeah, that guy's got some thick hair, man. I like to wish I could get my hair stand up like that. So uh, um, it's really, it's sloppy thinking when, oh, well, we can't really explain the pyramids. Must be aliens. Oh, I can't really explain the Nazca lines. Must be aliens. Oh, I really can't explain why my cat chases a red dot on the floor. Must be aliens. And so it's really kind of sloppy thinking, quite honestly. Yeah, we, we can bring that brother down. God bless him. Um, <laughs> my point being is, too, is that they are unidentified. And check this out. Here's something that you probably haven't heard about the UFO phenomenon. And that's the fact that many of the reports are only slightly ahead of known aeronautical phenomenon. Many of the reports are only slightly ahead of known aeronautical phenomenon. Uh, let, let me give you a couple of examples of this. In the Middle Ages, most there were UFO reports. In fact, Pharaoh Thutmose III made a UFO report. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, UFOs were typically described as flying shields or as flying spears. Did you know that in the 1700s, most of the UFO reports appeared as very similar to hot air balloons or blimps, like the Goodyear blimp? Um, did you know that in the 1950s, no one, prior to the 1950s, no one ever reported being beamed aboard a ship. 
after the debut of Star Trek in 1966, oh, that, that skyrocketed. Everyone's getting beamed aboard a ship all of a sudden. Uh, before Apollo 11 landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969, 50 years ago almost, not to make you feel old, nearly 50 years ago. Before that, guess where aliens often claim to be from? The moon or Venus. But not anymore. Today, aliens aren't claiming to be from the moon or Venus. So that's changed. So to me, it's, uh, it's interesting and it's very suspicious that the technology is only slightly ahead of known aeronautical technology. And so this brings us to number three. All right, so now we're kind of going to get into some of the good stuff, so to speak. Not really, though. Number three, the UFO phenomenon often has paranormal characteristics. And this is something you're probably not hearing about. The UFO phenomenon, generally it has paranormal characteristics. Now for starters, a very high percentage of people who claim to be abducted, and I believe they, in their mind they really were, I believe they had an experience, but a very high percentage of those who have been abducted admit to having been involved with the occult at some point. So what am I saying? They admit to, yeah, at some point in my life they're saying they dabbled with Ouija boards, they went to a psychic, they went to a palm reader, they regularly read horoscopes and our witchcraft itself, right? So it's kind of interesting. Now, nine times out of 10 in the forces of darkness, you have to introduce yourself, right? I mean, once you give your business card, <coughs> if you will, to them, well, yeah, they'll, hey, it's good to meet you and we've got a plan for your life as well. But that's one thing that's for starters. And by and large, people who have been abducted, these are not benevolent and wholesome experiences. Uh, people uh, report being terrorized uh, against their will. People are plagued with nightmares uh, often for the rest of their lives. But guess what? One of the most famous abduction cases took place in Arizona, Snowflake, Arizona. In fact, uh, it was made into a movie called uh, A Fire in the Sky. And it was a group of loggers back in 1975 that were outside of Snowflake, Arizona. And they saw a bright light in the sky. One of which, one of these loggers, Travis Walton by name, um, he went in for a closer look. And his fellow logger said he was struck by a beam of light and they panic, they run. They get in their truck and they head off. But then they say, hey, you know what, we can't leave Travis, we gotta go back. Uh, they go back and they can't find him. In fact, Travis Walton goes missing for five days. Five days he's missing. Now, the other loggers, in fact, they come under suspect for foul play by the local law enforcement authorities. But he resurfaced after five days, and he said this. He described it as devious activity that was conducted against his will. That's what Travis Walton said. Devious activity that was conducted against my will. Did you catch that? Devious and against my will. Something that he didn't want to experience. Um, interestingly, um, you know, how there's six degrees of separation. Kristen and I know a pastor over in Scottsdale and his wife who through a marriage, they know Travis Walton. And he's told me, because yeah, I've met him and talked to him, and he's just very matter of fact, hey, this is just what happened. This is how it went down. I'm not saying what it is, what happened, but I'm just telling you, this is what happened. Now, whereas people, you know, we generally heal from physical injuries, uh, psychological injuries, they can last a lifetime. They, they can mess you up, a psychological injury. You, you can carry that with you for the rest of your life. And it has the same characteristics often as someone who has PD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? I mean, it can cause personality change. It can cause personality disorder. And sadly, here's another stat you probably never hear. A significant percentage of UFO abductees end up committing suicide. Now, that's something that you're not hearing, are you? Um, what I'm saying is there, there's something that's really weird that's going on here, all right? There's something that's devious that's going on here. In fact, even the animal kingdom uh, seems to be affected by aliens. Uh, have you ever heard of Hugh Ross by chance? Dr. Hugh Ross, he's a Christian scientist. He said this, he said, animals, especially dogs, cattle, and horses, have shown noticeable agitation in the presence of UFOs. These animals have reportedly reacted before their human observers. In some cases, incessant barking and mooing occurred before, during, and after the sighting. In other cases, Dogs reportedly cowered and refused to go outside at the time of a UFO event. You know, dogs smarter than the humans. And cattle herds stampeded. Have you ever heard of Whitley Stryber? Uh, he said, I'm 80% 80 con 80 convinced that aliens are visitors from another dimension. I think he's right, a spiritual dimension. Uh, I'm talking 
demons. That's what I'm saying. Uh, just stay with me. Stay with me. Um, if you remove the spacecraft from an abduction encounter, do you know what you have? You have all the exact same characteristics you would see in a haunted house. Entities appearing and disappearing, entities moving through walls, uh, tormenting people, and uh, able to change their shape, able to change their form, and sometimes with physical scars. Uh, people who have been demonized or demon-possessed often report waking up with unexplained scratches on their body. Do you know the same thing happens with those who have been abducted? A lot of them report odd scars and weirdly enough, often around their reproductive organs. Uh, there's something weird that's going on here. And they seem to defy the law of physics, all right? They seem to defy the law of physics. Now, on television, or if you're a comic book writer, or if you're a sci-fi writer, hey, there are no limitations to what a spacecraft or what a body can do, a physical object, right? There's no limitations, only your imagination. But in the real world, the natural world that you and I live in, the tangible world, oh, there's a thing called the law of physics, right, that we're bound to. And if you'll notice, uh, there's some interesting, suspicious things about UFOs. For one, they never register any sonic booms, okay, when they break the sound barrier. Anything else, whether it's a comet or aircraft, if it breaks the sound barrier, there's a sonic boom. Nor do they, do they ever show any resistance at all. I mean, they never meet any air resistance, is what I'm saying. You know, it's like they're able to do these uh, moves and maneuvers, rather, that shows no sign whatsoever of being affected by the law of physics or air resistance. Here's what's odd too, they're able sometimes to be seen by people, but they don't show up on radar, and are, sometimes they show up on radar, but are not seen by people. And they're able to change their shape, they're able to change their size, they're able to change their color. What's my point? There's something spiritual going on here. There's a spiritual element that's going on here. Um, John Keel, who wrote a book called UFOs Operation Trojan Horse, uh, was interviewing one abductee, abductee who said this. He goes, UFOs, they behave as if they're alive. They seem as if they could read my mind. I don't think they're mechanical at all. I got the distinct impression it was alive. I think so. Spiritually, there's something going on. Now, in the Bible, uh, by the way, you can text in questions. I'm going to take a few questions at the end of this message. Feel free to text them in. Um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the devil is described as the prince of the power of the air. Prince of the power of the air. That's how Satan's described. Ephesians 6.12 says this. It's a famous passage. If you've been in church for a while, or if you grew up in church, you've probably heard this one. It's in the spiritual warfare, spiritual armor passage, and it says this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. I'm going to read this verse again. Let this one sink in. Listen to this one carefully. Ephesians 6, 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, where? In the heavenly places. The Bible reveals that there's intelligent creatures that are known as angels, right? Uh, the Bible, in fact, uniquely and accurately describes the spiritual realm. And angels, by the way, are intelligent, spiritual beings created by God who, guess what? They are not limited to the law of physics. Let me give you a few examples. They're capable of manifesting themselves, right? In fact, the, the writer of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2 says, you know what? Be careful how you treat strangers. You may have entertained an angel unaware. So they say, hey, be kind to strangers. Be kind to people you meet. They can obviously manifest themselves in a human form. Uh, we see also they're able to consume food, right? We see that with angels. And they have superpowers. Superpowers, yeah, they have superpowers. In uh, Genesis chapter 19, it's a couple of angels are given the task of rescuing Lot and his family from the impending doom that's coming upon the town of Sodom, all right? So two angels, hey, go to Sodom. This judgment's coming, rescue Lot and his family, get them out of there. That's the assignment of these two angels. Now, when they arrive in this town, it's totally perverse. In fact, uh, the men were told of, this, of the city, they seek to gang rape the angels. So again, showing you they can appear in a physical, tangible form, but they're angels. But the men of the city want to gang rape them, basically. And let me just read it to you what happens. 
Uh, it says in verse 9, Genesis 19, says they kept bringing pressure to, you know, gang rapers, wannabes. They keep bringing pressure on Lot and move forward to break down the door. They're wanting to kick the door down to get to him. But the angels inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness. They're able to affect you physically. Right? And it's like they zapped them. It kind of sounds like the Green Lantern. Like, zzzz. You know, the angels just like zapped them with blindness. They have powers. They have abilities. Now, the majority of angels are loyal to God. The majority. The majority of angels are loyal to God. But a sizable minority rebelled along with Lucifer. And they are now known as demons. Fallen angels. Unclean spirits. Evil spirits. And they, uh, they always seek to destroy humanity. Did you know that in the Gospel of Mark, 20% of the miracles that Jesus performs are exorcisms? 20%. One out of five. And every time in the Bible, in the Gospels, the eyewitness accounts, whenever you see someone who's being demon-possessed, oh, they're being dismantled. They're being broken down. It's like, yeah, he tries to throw him into the fire. He tries to drown him. Uh, this guy's cutting himself all the time. I mean, it's weird, right? I mean, you always see humans are being dismantled, and that's what the devil does. Jesus even said, look, the thief, he only comes for one reason, to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. That's what he does. Now, if that were not enough, we also see the abilities of the forces of darkness. Um, in what's called the birth pains passage, hey, remember our buddy Matthew, Matthew 24? Um, he says it, one of the birth pains, you know, towards the end of the age is that false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform what kind of signs? Great signs and wonders. To do what? To deceive. If possible, even you, even the elect. Second Thessalonians 2.9 says, The coming of the lawless one, lawless -less one, who is the Antichrist, will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use, listen to this, all sorts of displays of power through what? Signs and wonders. Okay? So we're seeing a trend here that serve the lie. What lie? That Jesus is not the Christ. They're always trying to lead people away from Jesus. In a Revelation chapter 13, we see uh, what's known as the false prophet. And it says this, he performed, it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Hey, full view of the people. This is, hey, this isn't a second-hand, third-hand report. Now, I'm go he's going to call fire down from heaven. So what's the point here? It's that the forces of darkness have the ability to do great signs and wonders. Right? By the way, how can you tell if a sign or wonder is from the Holy Spirit or if it's from an evil spirit? If it's from the Holy Spirit, it's always going to point to Jesus. Yeah. All right, it will always point to Jesus. That's how you can tell. The Holy Spirit hasn't come to make anyone rich, hasn't come to make anyone sell more CDs, hasn't come, I mean, to make a, whatever. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, look, he will testify about me. That's how you can always tell if it's of the Holy Spirit. Well, these things uh, don't. Uh, they don't really do that. Um, but anyway, I'm going to get to that in just a second. But let me say this. Here's a point. Um, the forces of darkness have the ability to perform great feats of wonder. If they can call fire down from heaven, to me it shouldn't be a shocker that they can call something to appear as a spacecraft from another galaxy. If they can cause, do great signs and wonders and call, cause fire to come down from heaven, it shouldn't be a shocker that they can appear, manifest themselves as a being from another planet. Shouldn't be a shocker. Point being is the scriptures tell us the demons have this ability, the forces of darkness have this ability. Uh, they have a record, by the way, I might add, of being uh, malevolent and insidious. So I don't really think it's an invasion, an alien invasion from another planet, in my opinion. Uh, from what I see, I think it's a, a spiritual invasion from another dimension, is just looking at the track record. This brings us to uh, point number four. They have the same message as other false prophets. This is one you're not hearing too much. They have the exact same message as other false prophets. Now, Paul said to the church at Galatia this, he goes, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Ooh, that's some pretty strong language. You know why? Because they're leading people away from Jesus. As we have already said, and so now I say it again, so Paul's doubling down. I'm doubling down on you. You really need to hear this. Guys, everyone, y'all hear this? You listening? You need to hear this. As I've already said, I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accept it, let them be under God's curse. Because they're leading people away from salvation. Jesus loves people. He's a lover of people. Look, it's more than lip service. He went to the cross for you. All right, he went to the cross for you. He took that crown of thorns for you. He loves you. And he doesn't like people messing with his kids. 
If you try to lead someone away, you know, what do you say about kids? Like, if you offend one of these little ones, it'd be better to put a millstone around our neck and throw them into the ocean. That's what he says. Um, they have another message. They failed the Jesus test, is what I'm saying. So far, no alien has ever said, the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. There's no record of that, right? None of them have said, oh, yeah, you need to be born again. No alien has said that. You know what they promote? Uh, basically, uh, just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, New Age, Eastern mysticism. That's what they pretty much promote. They proclaim a different gospel, which isn't a gospel at all. In fact, if you follow this UFO trail down the rabbit hole far enough, guess where it's going to take you? It's going to take you into the occult. If you go to one of the last of the remaining bookstores, Barnes & Noble, um, you go in there and say, hey, where's your UFO section? You know where they're going to lead you to? The religion section. Yeah, along with witchcraft and everything else. They preach a different message. They seek to deceive their human contacts as, oh yeah, we're an advanced uh, civilization uh, from a distant uh, galaxy. That's what they try to portray themselves as. Less obvious is their message, which is basically as old as the Garden of Eden. Oh, you can be, like, you can be a god too. Oh, you don't have to follow all these rules. Oh, you don't have to follow the Lord. Oh, no, you know, you can, you can do your own thing. That, that, look, that's as old as the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. That's nothing new. Um, it's basically it's promoting cosmic evolution. Look, let me just say this real quick. In my opinion, I can get that up in Sedona. So you came all the way from Alpha Centauri to give me an unwanted uh, colonoscopy <laughs> and some uh, new age mumbo jumbo. Hey, I could have saved you a trip. Could have just gone up to Sedona. I can get a bunch of New Age literature and info and colonoscopies up there. Sorry you came all the way. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really nothing new. But they seek to deceive people. And this is what the forces of darkness do. And it's built upon a false premise, really, of evolution. This is where it starts all along. This is, this is the, the foundation, the keystone is evolution. See, here's what people are thinking. If people who falsely believe in evolution, which, by the way, is a theory that's never been proven fact, people who believe that say, oh, well, you know what? I guess if life just randomly happened here like sea monkeys, water and some a lightning flash, and hey, here we are. Wow, awesome. Happy Memorial Day. I mean, here we are, just through some random acts. Well, if it happened here, I guess it could happen somewhere else, right? See, that's the premise. That's the foundation. So the foundation is broken. It's cracked from the very beginning. Look, let me say this, Darwin, I'm, I'm gonna cut Darwin a little slack, let me tell you why. In his day, the fossil records, the fossil evidence that was available, it could fit in this room. Today, museums are full of fossils, so many they can't even display them all, none of which demonstrate the transition of one species into another. In Darwin's day, you know what his primary scientific instrument was? It was a, a microscope that the quality of which would be akin to what you would buy in the toy section of uh, Walmart for ages 8 to 12. Right? Well, today we've got microscopes that can see DNA. Right? We've got telescopes that can indeed see into other galaxies. Now, I hope this isn't a, a news flash to anybody, but Darwinian evolution has never been proven to be fact. It remains a theory. Consider some of the following proofs. Let me give you some facts of what, what the proofs we do have. It looks like intelligent design took place. Uh, we are just the right distance from the sun. If we were much further, uh, we would freeze. If we were much closer, we would roast. Um, the tilt on our axis provides us, provides us with just the right inclination to have four distinct seasons, except for Arizona. Hey, it's been a great spring, though, right? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. It's been a great spring and winter, best since I've been out here. Um, did you know that we have... Uh, a moon that happens to be just perfect. If it were much larger, there would be massive tidal flooding. If it were much smaller, our oceans would stagnate. We happen to have an ozone layer that protects us from the sun's radiation. We even have the right mixture of oxygen. If it were much richer, we'd be on a very flammable planet. We just happen to have Jupiter. And Jupiter, what's that got to do with anything? It happens to be the right size and distance to serve as a comet sweeper. Not all, but the vast majority of asteroids are drawn into Jupiter rather than the Earth. And we're even in the safe zone, like you see this picture here? That's actually where we really are. We're actually in the right part of the Milky Way galaxy. If we were much closer, the radiation would be too intense even for our ozone layer. Point being, it looks like everything has been planned out just right for life on Earth. 
God had you in mind. Who in the world can think through all that? God. There's no civilization that can think through all that. Only God can think through everything. Everything has been planned out just for you, with you in mind. And this brings us to the last point, which is, I think the UFO phenomenon reflects spiritual hunger of today's culture. Um, we witnessed this back in 1996. They found a, a Martian meteorite that under a microscope it had lo what looked like, hey, maybe that's an amoeba or something. It was later found not to be the case. But um, I remember uh, President Clinton, he actually had a news conference, and he said this. He goes, uh, today Rock 84001 <laughs> speaks to us across all those billions of years, <clears throat> millions of miles, it speaks the possibility of life. If this discovery is confirmed, it wasn't. If this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights in our universe that science has ever uncovered. <laughs> its implications are far-reaching, awe-inspiring, as can be imagined. Um, reading between the lines, you can see that desperation. Desperation for what? Purpose in life. Why are we here? Well, you know, it's, that, that's, that's, uh, that's what's happening. It's like it shows that, to me, in my opinion, uh, the UFO phenomenon reflects a hunger in today's culture for meaning in life. That there's got to be more than getting up, going to work, coming home, going to bed, getting up, going. It's got to be more to life. And there is. There is. You have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And the forces of darkness are seeking to deceive you and distract you from your true calling. You have been created in the image of God. Hey, look, if uh, Romulans and Kryptonians and Vulcans do exist, God bless them. Uh, but Yeah, God bless them. But here's what I do know. You have been created in the image of God. That's what I do know. Here's what I do know. Humanity on planet Earth, we're in need of salvation. Amen. We're in need of redemption is what I do know. Whether they exist or not, we here on planet Earth, oh, we got some problems. Yeah, and they all stem from sin. You can trace the root to every problem back to sin. Someone not following God's plan. God is like, look, uh, he, he doesn't give us uh, you know, guidelines or laws or rules to try and make. He's, he's not a killjoy. It's quite the opposite. He's trying to save you from a lot of unnecessary heartache. Right? That's what all of his plans are for. Look, I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to show you. Look, that's the unwise way. It's going to lead to failure. It's going to lead to disappointment. It's going to lead to bad habits and addictions. That, that's not the way to go. Trust me, I know the way. Jesus even says that he is the way. And to me, this UFO phenomenon reflects uh, the need or the desire, rather, for a cosmic savior. That's what they're really looking for. Oh, perhaps some advanced civilization will be able to solve the world's problems. Perhaps some advanced civilization can give me purpose and meaning to life. Um, no, it won't. It, it'd, it'd be pretty awesome in some ways. It'd be pretty cool. I'm sure it'd be, make the headline news for a while, but You've still got the problem of sin. I've still got the problem of sin that only Jesus can heal, that only Jesus can deal with. There was a famous uh, French mathematician. Some of you may have heard him. His name was Blaise Pascal. And he taught the idea that we all have a God-shaped vacuum. And when it's shaped in the side, you know, it's shaped just like God. It's, it's, it's a vacuum. And most of us sense this. Most of us sense, hey, there's something missing in my life. And so we try to fill it with success. We try to fill it through relationships. We try to fill it through feelings, whatever. We're all, and it's only temporary. It doesn't completely fill it because it's a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. I mean, it's like a piece of the puzzle, and you've done this thousand-piece puzzle, but there's this one section that's missing. Well, yeah, that's the God section. And so Jesus deals with the problem of sin, and he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what it comes down to, is uh, whether they exist or not, we've got a sin problem. All right, uh, that only Jesus can cure. And Jesus alone can offer us forgiveness and everlasting life. And that's what he wants so badly. He wants to reverse the curse. And he will. He's going to come back one day. All right? It's going to happen. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth, in fact. All right? And that's his plan for you, is to uh, be a part of his plan. Because he loves you. He knows all about you. He's watched you since the day you were born. He will see you when you take your last breath. And he loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for you. Uh, I remember the old four spiritual laws uh, back in the day. A guy named Bill Bright wrote it. And it used to be like in a thing called a gospel track. And that was number one. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And so I want to encourage you and those of you watching my video, don't be deceived. Don't allow yourself to fall prey to this deception. And hey, it's okay to study. It's fun to watch science fiction movies. But at the end of the day, who do you say Jesus is at the end of the day? And uh, Jesus is the Christ who loves you and offers forgiveness and everlasting life. And uh, I want to pray for you right now, and then I'm going to take a few text questions. 
If you've never asked Jesus to save you, uh, we want to encourage you to do so today. And um, we, don't, we don't like for people to feel like they're alone when they're doing this. And so we're going to pray this prayer out loud. All right, so just uh, join me in saying this out loud. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, believe I believe you are the Christ. Forgive me for my sins. Me for my sins. And save my soul. Save my soul. And take me, take me to heaven when I die. Hey, with your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, if you prayed that for the first time, um, Jesus heard your prayer. And the scriptures say, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I was just wonder if you'd lift your hand for me. Anybody prayed it for the first time? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, anybody else? All right, great. You guys can look up. And uh, let me take a few text questions here real quick. And I've got a free booklet for you, by the way. Uh, if you pray that prayer, as you leave today, you're going to see a red and white booklet. that says, Why Jesus? And please take that. It has my business card in it. I would love to meet with you and answer any questions about what you've heard this morning. Those of you watching online, you can uh, just go to our res or it's on our website somewhere, all right? So uh, you can get it free. It's in a PDF format on uh, northchapel.net. And for all of you, um, uh, we have a free booklet for you today. It's called What on Earth am, am I Here For? What on Earth Am I Here For? And it's some principles uh, from a book Rick Warren wrote years ago, but it's a little booklet, and I would encourage you to take that. Why are we here? What are we doing? Well, he does a little better job than what I did this morning of explaining that. So with that, let me do a few text questions, and then uh, we'll close out with some worship, and uh, we will call it a day. So number one, um, isn't it arrogant to think that we're the only intelligent life form in the universe? Um, I don't think it's, my opinion, I don't think it's arrogant. Uh, for many of us, we just simply need some convincing proof. There's no convincing proof that there is life out there. So it's just... For most of us, it's just simply uh, rational. Uh, there is a guy named Enrico Fermi. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a scientist, and he even has his own uh, formula now, kind of like Ackman's razor. It's called the Fermi Paradox. And the Fermi Paradox teaches that if the life is, universe is teeming with life, where is everybody? Where is everyone? Is what he's saying. So, so anyways, if they do exist, they too are created by God. The Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if they do exist, guess what? God's their creator, all right? Um, I know that we're created in the image of God. What these other things are created in, I don't know. But I know that we're created in the image of God. All right, let's do a few more here. Uh, what about Ezekiel's wills? I knew someone was going to ask that one. Um, Ezekiel's wills. Uh, so those of you who are unfamiliar, um, hmm, that's a good one too. Um, so... Ezekiel makes this description in chapter 1 of seeing wheels within wheels, and they seem metallic. They seem like they have an exhaust. They have these very beautiful colors. But Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 begins, the very first, ver I mean, barely out of the gate, he says, I had visions. I had visions. So what's a vision? It's kind of like a dream. Okay, it's uh, something that happens with prophets where God speaks to them like, I'm going to show you some things. I'm going to show you the future. So it's a vision. He wasn't actually saying, hey, well, there it goes over to... Nile River right now, that wasn't the case. He said, I had visions. And in the context of Ezekiel, it seems to be showing this, that Ezekiel is when the Hebrews, they're on their way to Babylon. It's a sad time, right? They are getting relocated out of their homeland. It'd be like someone picking you up and you're going to a distant country to eat different foods and speak a different language. In fact, there's a psalm that says that they, uh, they hung their harps on the willow trees. Because the Babylonians said, hey, sing to us one of your famous songs. Sing, sing us one of those psalms. And our hearts are too heavy. We can't. So we hung up our harps. We're not singing anymore. It's a sad day. So I think what's happening here, and not just me, but other Bible commentators, think that it's showing that wherever you go, Hebrews, I go. You are never out of my sight. If you go east, I'm going with you. If you go north, I go with you. If you go south, I go. No matter where you go, it's showing God's omnipotence that we can never escape his presence. All right, do a few more here. Uh, kind of already answered that one. Would it discredit, would overwhelming and convincing proof of ETI, that means extraterrestrial intelligence, undermine and discredit Christianity? Absolutely not. Uh, again, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And um, so there's a verse in John 2. Um, um, John 1 verse 3 says, uh, all things were made through him, Jesus, and without him was not, was not anything made that was made. So simply put, if they do exist, God's their creator as well. Uh, to me, there's no proof that they do, in my opinion, right? Okay, a few more here, coming down the home stretch. Um, wouldn't it be a lot of wasted space if we're the only ones in the universe? Yeah, that's, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jody Foster is here with us today. So Jody, uh, I'd love to meet you. My wife and I are, no, we'd love to say hello to you. Um, 
I don't think so. To me, uh, not at all. Let me tell you why. I mean, again, I'm just speaking from my own opinion here. Um, if you ever been to the beach and you kind of had the beach to yourself, and you just look out the ocean, it's like, wow, man, it's amazing. I mean, look, I mean, it's like it goes on forever. I mean, it's just overwhelming. And to me, uh, it just gives us a glimpse of God's omnipotence, of his eternity, of how big uh, the Lord, you know, how God really is. And so uh, to me, uh, it wouldn't, you know, um, maybe they need to receive Jesus. I don't know. I mean, we know that eventually there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And there are some people, even like C.S. Lewis, who believe that, hey, maybe who knows one day, we know we're going to rule and reign with Christ. Maybe when he makes all things new, a new heavens, a new earth, maybe that includes somehow we will have stewardship over other planets in the future. So, no, I, I think not. Um, okay, worship team, you can come on up. I'm going to do a few more here. Uh, okay. Oh, man, okay. I knew someone was going to ask about the Nephilim. Were the Nephilim the offspring of demonic angels and humans? And did the mixing of humans and demons bring about the flood? Um, Here's what we do know, okay, so uh, something incredibly perverse and weird is going on in Genesis 6, at the very least, what I will say, something very perverse is going on. Uh, basically, it does indeed seem that the forces of darkness were seeking to interfere with the procreation process, right, they're interfering with it. Remember the plan from back with Adam and Eve, go and populate the earth, and they're interfering with that. So it very well may be, but I do believe that was an evil, whatever it was, it was an evil influence upon the procreation process where it was so bad that God says, I'm going to have to start from scratch. I'm going to have to start from scratch here. All right, that's how bad it had gotten. Well, hey, I want to thank you so much for being with us uh, today.